Well, welcome to the first public live stream in a very long time. So the first thing I want to mention is that these are not intended to be fixed live streams, meaning I don't have a set schedule for it yet. However, since I've been doing so many Rembrandt studies as pre-recorded videos and editing them to 30 minutes for the past like couple months or past two months, I'm going to do this. Um, I'm at least going to start it live and we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, so I'm not really going to be speaking as much when I'm painting, but I will be doing the best that I can to answer all questions that come my way. Uh, hello there, Olivia. So everyone that is wondering if this is live or not, this is actually live. So again, feel free to ask me questions while I'm painting and I'll do the best to respond to you as quickly and adequately as I can. So this is the same color palette that I've had for a long time now. So this is just lead white. This is lead tin yellow, yellow ochre. This is actually a new color for me, Italian uh, brown ochre. This is Italian brown ochre, cadmium red medium, transparent mummy, burnt sienna, alizarin permanent, raw umber, which is you're going to see for the most of today is just going to be mostly raw umber, but we might get into color. We'll, we'll see. This is just uh, black and then cobalt blue. The colors are listed in the description box down for you in case you want to know exactly what colors I'm using. For the most part, they are Rublev brand. Rublev these days is my favorite brand to use. So I'm quickly just trying to place the head here. So I typically like to have a head about the size of my hand. So if you saw that in some of the pre recorded videos, my hand. It, Placed like this is just uh, gauging the size of the head that I want and then I try to center the head on a horizontal but have it a little bit slightly off on a vertical uh, so hello there um, Barack and Leonardo hello also from time to time I will take a break so I do have a, a little picture that you're going to see on the screen every time I take a break. I'm getting used to this vertical palette again. I haven't really used a vertical palette in some time. So like I wrote in the comment that I pinned, this is, this is going to be a little different from the live streams that you saw in the past so I'm not really going to be speaking and explaining everything as I was before so instead it's going to be more of a, a slow paced kind of scenario so since he's three quarters actually turned this way I'm trying to move his head a little bit further to the left I think that's about good Hello there, Christine, Miriam, and uh, let's see, Guitar. Also, the photo reference for that is linked in the description. So if you want to draw, if you want to draw with me or paint with me, feel free. This image is from the National Gallery of Art in the UK. I pretty much did most of the self-portraits of Rembrandt uh, on Google Arts and Culture. And then I ended up discovering the uh, images that they have in the National, National Gallery in the UK. So it's pretty good resolution. Place the head over here. All right, so we got a question from Olivia. How long have you been painting for? Uh, over 10 years, I'd say 12 years now. I did take a little break in between in my uh, early to mid 20s. But I have been painting for more than a decade. And these are meant to be master studies. 
not master copies. The reason I'm focusing on Rembrandt so much these days is because every time I attempt one of these studies, every time I do one of these studies, I learn something new. And I believe this Rembrandt painting is from uh, 1669, which is the year that he passed away. So you can definitely tell, even in his last year, Rembrandt was pretty much a rock star in painting. Hi, Nyla. This is just a uh, Viva brand paper towel. I'm using as my eraser. So I'm just walking my way around the outside very slowly. Okay, so I, I think that the placement is somewhat decent. In the beginning, it's hard just getting the head placed in the right place. Speaking of head, uh, my head may get in the way once in a while of the camera shot. I apologize for that. The um, canvas that I'm working on is at a slight angle, not a severe angle like it used to be. So there's going to be some distortion. And what you're seeing. The head is still a decent size. Hey, Michael. Oh, let's see. I really like your paint along last year. I painted a similar picture to this picture. Yep, definitely. Uh, I would. I even redo the same Rembrandt study. So, for example, I'm eventually going to go back to that really famous one from the National Gallery in D.C. The one that shows up every time you Google Rembrandt. Because every time, like I was saying, every time I learn something new. Okay. Now let's start to guesstimate uh, where the features are going to go. Thanks for watching from Australia. You can kind of say a lot about the portrait with just that. So that for me, that's giving me an idea of what the thirds are going to be like. The third, so the forehead is one third. Down to the nose is another third. So just a little mark like that. I can get a lot of information. Now this process is going to be, I, I keep saying the same term, uh, very slow. So by no means is this meant to be like some kind of Vala Prima that's going to magically be completed in a couple hours. Not at all. This is something that is going to take potentially two weeks or some or maybe more the last few rembrandts that i did that you saw as pre-recorded videos took two weeks with a couple different sessions in between hey olivia uh let's see is there any particular reason you like to make heads uh, your hand size? Uh, my hand is a little smaller, at least I think it is. It's, it's about the size of my face, if not a little smaller than my own face. And I like to do portrait studies or head studies that are 
close to life size, but slightly smaller. Definitely not larger than life size. That's the only reason. Because if I work any larger, then it starts to be kind of weird. If I work smaller, then the drawing becomes a little more difficult. It's going to start off looking very much like a cartoon, but I'm looking for just light and dark. Big shapes. And at, at this point, I'm making the most mistakes possible. Not really on purpose, but I'm anticipating that they're going to happen. This canvas is a 11 by 14 inch oil prime linen fine textured Classen's brand. And I toned it with Alkyd oil paint, black and white and raw umber Alkyd oil paint about a week or two ago, maybe even longer than that. I'm also working from a iPad, so I have my iPad to the left of me here. And at this point, I try to keep the features very maneuverable. I want to give myself as much of an opportunity to move things around. All of the proportions are open to discussion. But I do like to uh, focus towards the main triangle. So for example, I, I might actually have to move this up. I believe I'm going to have to move the nose up. And there will be dozens of mistakes in this process. Get it wrong as many times as you can before you figure out the right answer. If you're afraid to get it wrong, then that can be a hindrance. So give yourself enough time to get it wrong because that's natural. That's part of the process. Hey, Miriam. Let's see. Last, uh, let's see, eight months ago I painted the girl with the pearl earring. Let's see. Oh yeah, that was a while ago. That one is a difficult one. That That's actually the third project in my online classes, is the pearl earring. So this is a size 2, size 2 filbert bristle brush, silver brush brand, in case anyone's wondering. Hey Gon, thanks for watching from Russia.
Now I'm trying to keep the narration very um very art focused in the past when I used to do live streams. I kind of tried a little too hard to make it like a like a TV show talk show host or something like that. I'm aware of that. So I'm going to do the best that I can to try to keep it as um art based as possible. And by the way, please uh, feel free to post what you draw or paint along with me during these public virtual painting sessions. This is not really meant to be a lesson. I, I have my online classes. Uh, you can definitely check them out in the description box. But uh, th this isn't really meant to be like a like a classroom setting. This is basically just you and me and Rembrandt. And we're drawing and painting and learning. Hey Rosario, thanks for watching from Argentina. So right now I'm I'm thinking about the basic placement of the head, but also the proportions in terms of the height to width ratio. Now, I don't really like to measure that much. However, I do like to use horizontals and verticals. So right now, I'm relating the position of the ear relative to the nose. Ears a little bit higher up. As a whole, I think that this whole little collar thing's gonna have to move up. Since I had to move the nose up, everything's gonna move up a little bit. Hey Nishi, Nishali, thanks for watching from New Jersey. And in the beginning of your paintings, try the best that you can to not use medium or solvent. Try to keep it just oil paint. That's why there's nothing on this paper towel. It's just paper towel, right? It's There's no medium but the paper towel to erase. Raw umber is naturally very transparent. So it's pretty easy to push around. On its own, it looks pretty brown, but if you mix it with white, it actually turns like a cool gray. I try to look at the distance from the bottom of the nose down to the top of the upper lip. So this is a little bit long right now. Hey Jules. Again, the mouth is just a couple lines. Pretty simple to move. And I, I really do feel like I need to justify why I've been doing so many Rembrandt studies. For those of you that don't know about the significance of Rembrandt to portrait painting. 
So for example, Rembrandt is known as the interpreter of the human condition when it comes to painting portraits, painting images of human beings, right? But what that means is that he has that something else factor to his painting. So it's it's something difficult to describe, and I don't even think it's something that can be put into words. So being able to spend this much time focusing on Rembrandt images, you actually get you actually pick up some of that unspoken or un things that you can't really verbalize about painting. Another thing that you'll you'll see later on is the texture to Rembrandt paintings. And there's something about 17th century paintings that sets it apart uh, in terms of texture. A lot of it has to do with the fact that they had to grind up their pigments and maul them out uh, themselves, or they had students do that for them, but they weren't really kept in tubes that much. Or at all, really. They, they didn't have tubes. The uh, tube for oil paint was invented much later. So there's something about the thickness and the richness to 17th century uh, paintings, which is why I like to use Rublev, because Rublev is, uh, they market it as, as close to the old master's paint as you can get. And I, I think that's actually a true statement. Rublev is definitely my favorite brand. The only reason I have non-Rublev colors is because Rublev doesn't make the color. So alizarin permanent, Rublev doesn't make it, so I have Gamblin for that. And then cobalt blue, Rublev has a different variation of cobalt blue that's kind of greenish, so I chose uh, Williamsburg. And then the old Holland cadmium red, uh, I will switch to Rublev eventually with that. Looking at the angle between the eyes. Seems to be about correct. So basically, I tend to focus a lot on the face. Everything around is just going to be kind of left unanswered for the most part. Sometimes I actually go and put the background in first if I'm doing a larger composition. But for these studies, this will suffice. Hey Leo V, uh, it's great to be back. These live streams, I um, I definitely miss the connection, the connections that you make with with others, other artists on the internet. But in the past, like I said, I I made it a little too much like a like a talk show host. So I'm trying to keep this a little bit more about painting. Okay. So I'm sitting back. Standing is also a good idea. Eventually I will take a break during this live stream and I have a little um, image that you'll see on the screen. I'll probably take like maybe a, a couple minute break at a time. That's one difference to how I was doing the streams before. Before I just kind of bulldozed through everything. Not so much anymore. I 
And like I was saying before, there's not going to be a fixed schedule at the moment. So basically whenever I'm painting, whenever I'm working on this painting, I will turn on the cameras. So please uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on the notification to receive updates for when I'm streaming. Ingrid. Okay, so in terms of his expression, a lot of spots that there are key points here that I look for. He tends to raise his eyebrows a little bit here, kind of a worried look but his mouth is a little bit more almost like Mona Lisa uh, very relaxed so I've noticed this in a lot of his self portraits there's a, a certain Rembrandt kind of expression he has this kind of worried contemplative yet uh, calm look to him hey jo uh Let's see, Joshua. Let's see, just bought a house, inspired me to make an oil painting room so I can record myself painting. Yeah, definitely, go for it. Go for it. Hey, Jonas, thanks for watching from Sweden. Oh, I'm glad that you like the uh, portrait painting tutorials. So remember, everyone, there's not going to be any editing involved in this, so. You're going to see it as it is. Very slow with lots of mistakes. That eventually gets resolved as the painting process moves on. Let me see if I can get the angle of his nose. Remember everyone, the photo reference link is in the description box, so definitely feel free to draw and paint along with me. And post them to your social medias. You don't have to tag me if you don't want to. But definitely study these Rembrandts. Hey Olivia, hard to find content like this, makes me feel lucky. Uh, this guy's doing master studies with us for free. Oh, thank you. Definitely draw or paint along with me. That, that, that's what I want to get out of this. Among other things, I want to uh, bring attention to this activity where you're spending time learning. It's like going to the gym, like eating your vegetables. It's not always the most fun thing to have to do many master studies, although for me it tends to be kind of fun. But there's so much that you can learn, especially from Rembrandt. Hey Maria, thanks for watching from Argentina. Uh, yeah, this will be saved as a pre recorded. So once this live stream ends, you will be able to watch this as a pre-recorded video. At least that's the plan. It all depends on YouTube, really. Okay, I think I've drawn enough for the face. I don't think there are too many uh, major mistakes, and there are mistakes here for sure. Uh, that's one thing I want to emphasize a little bit more, is that 
it's a series of corrections. Drawing is a series of corrections, as my teachers would tell me. So you kind of have to understand it and be patient with yourself. And you basically build your patience through your experience. Some of us are just naturally more patient. I'm not someone that's naturally patient. That's something that I had to work work on. Hey, pencil subway art. Uh, let's see. Love your videos. Oh, thanks, man. I'm glad that you like that I share the process. Hey, Maria. Uh, medium. This is just the oil paint. I'm not using anything extra. You may have seen something earlier, this little dripper. This just has spike lavender, which every time I, since this is vertical, every time I had to drip it on there, it kind of fell towards the bottom. Um, but just a few drops of spike lavender. And that's just my solvent to get the paint to flow a little bit. Uh, but no extra medium at all. And in the first layers, you really don't want to use too much medium. If you do, make sure that you use a fast dryer and not a slow dryer. But it's best to avoid using medium. The only reason I used the spike lavender was to get the paint uh, thin. You see here it's kind of thin. And that helped me with the initial marks. But even now, as I'm refining these shapes a little bit, I, I really don't need to thin out the paint anymore. And I'm kind of just sketching in these half tones. They don't really need to be there. This is just kind of me figuring out where something is going to be. However, it's not really a good idea to do that. Uh, try to keep it just light and shadow as much as possible. In fact, I need to follow my own advice. So, so now it's actually a good time to start drawing with color. So I'm going to start to make my little pre-mixtures. Hey Jean, uh, thanks for watching from Brazil. Um, hey Leo V, been thinking of using walnut oil. Oh, thank you so much uh, Pencil Subway Art for your super chat. Thank you, thank you so much about the super chat. Uh, let's see, a video you did about three years ago gave me confidence to paint my self-portrait. Keep being awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to get my palette knife. And we're going to mix up some colors. And it's going to be a system of colors ranging from this point first, which is going to be the highlight. So I'm going to go with lead tin yellow, lead tin yellow light, that is. And let's say, you know, that could almost really be the highlight on its own, but I'm going to add a little bit of burnt sienna. You can see just how much paint I use. So I actually just went right through all of my lead tin yellow. So those of you that are wondering about working with hazardous materials like lead, I assure you that you will be just fine if you're very careful about it. So I'm wearing gloves when I open the tube. It is very difficult to get lead poisoning from touching lead oil paints however it's possible so if i ran my finger through the lead it probably i'd probably be fine however you don't want to have that risk so if you can minimize that risk then that's a good idea the lead in the lead tin yellow or the lead white is not going to jump out and attack you so just be very uh just be very cautious with not getting it on your hands. And another thing is don't eat, drink, or smoke or anything that involves using your hands and um, stuff like that while you're painting. Now, of course, you can drink like a bottle of water or something. Just don't touch the top. Things like that. So now we're using the lead white. And I start with lead white with the... Um, 
linseed oil and I think someone asked me about walnut oil uh, walnut oil is pretty good to use but it's slow dryer so I'd recommend uh, using linseed oil based oil paints first and then after maybe like four or five layers you can switch to walnut oil if you like walnut oil tends to yellow less which is good but it takes a long time to dry Uh, let's see. Hey Garcia, thanks for watching from uh, from Mexico. And I think you have a Rembrandt on your uh, little picture there. That's that's cool. Let's see. Ingrid, you are using a limited palette. Yeah, it is uh, a fairly limited palette. Uh, Shuvir, this is a live uh, painting demonstration basically a virtual painting session all right so now i'm going to move and make the next value which is going to be this one it's meant to be this one that exists over here and then over here which is a secondary light so this is going to be the first mid-tone and since this is kind of a tiny palette setup i'm going to have to be a little strategic with how i organize these colors so this is a little bit more pinkish, so I'm going to go in with the cadmium red, medium, just a little bit. More lead tin yellow. This is the part in the video in the pre-recorded videos that I think takes the longest time and this is because these mixtures do take a while to get just right and you want each one of these pre-mixtures to fit some section of the portrait that you're doing and then after I make these pre-mixtures of the skin tone I'm actually going to make uh, three other ones so this palette is going to be full of pre-mixed colors Hello, zombie. If I, I'm so glad you're excited for the live stream. It's an easygoing process. So that is the second value. So this should relate to here. Now I'm going to mix this one. This value is similar to this one, similar to this one. So that's going to be the third value down. So I'm going to go to the burnt sienna. Transparent Mummy. Yellow Ochre. It's a little bit warm, but not bright red, so I'm not going to go into my Alizarin Permanent. Back to Lead White. And this is going to be one value down from this one. A little more orangey red, so more transparent mummy. And you want to mix a generous amount. So when I'm done painting, I'm going to get these paints and stick them in a container and put the container in the freezer. So I don't end up letting my paint dry and then not being able to use it. So now we're mixing up the next one. So I'm actually going to need a little more raw umber. So what I'm using is French umber, which is raw umber. They just call it French umber, again from Rubla. Now the fourth one is definitely a little darker. A little more transparent mummy. So this one has to relate. Let's say it relates to this little half tone here. And it's actually 
borderline shadow, so it's almost a shadow value, really. So it's the dark light slash shadow. And actually, most of these colors are very transparent. Only four of these colors are opaque. So uh, lead white is opaque, lead tin yellow is opaque, cadmium red is opaque, and cobalt blue is opaque. Everything else is transparent. So that's one nice thing about this palette setup. Now we're going to make another mixture, which is going to be black and alizarin permanent. So I use alizarin permanent these days because of the the fact that if you mix uh, traditional alizarin with say lead white or uh, some kind of like opaque color it may have the tendency to fade over time so alizarin is actually supposed to be used as a glaze predominantly alizarin permanent avoids that problem because you can use it in the lights without having to worry about it fading. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mix a cool blue. So that's going to be cobalt blue. Lead white. So every time I need to rapidly cool off one of these colors, the cobalt blue mixed with titanium white will do the job. And I urge you use cobalt blue because it is a really nice in the middle blue. Ultramarine, depending on the brand, tends to lean towards uh, the violet. Unless you want to be really old school about it and you can use the genuine ultramarine which is uh, lapis. Hello there. Uh, hey Evans. Alright, next thing I'm going to do is mix a kind of uh, pinkish warm. I'm trying to get some of this raw umber off of here. So I'm going to create a combination that's reddish orangey. And this is going to be so that if I need to, or when I need to put more heat, like in here, more warmth, like over here, here, and here, I'm going to have something to do that quickly with. So that's going to be transparent mummy, white, cadmium red. Okay, next I'm going to mix a greenish tone. So it's going to be, this is a really nice greenish color to use for skin tones actually, when you want to cool things off. So like for example around here, I'm probably going to use it, or around here, if we even get to that today. So yellow ochre and cobalt blue make a really nice green to use for skin tones. Hello there, 128 Studio. Thanks for watching from uh, Malaysia. Uh, Ingrid, yep, yeah, this is a linen canvas. It's a uh, double oil primed, fine textured uh, from uh, Klassen's brand that I stretched uh, a while ago and then toned with uh, titanium white ivory black and the raw umber alkyd so this is done with uh, the tone is done with alkyd so slow and steady is the pace here there we go now we have a nice consistency a really nice green to use so at first this seemed like a very limited palette but really what this is is a customizable palette that I can just take colors from 
And then of course I'm gonna have to recharge uh, the mixtures once in a while. So now we can go ahead and start to build. And I like to build a little bit at a time. Hey, pencil subway. Um, yeah, I wouldn't use this right away though on its own. And you, you'll see what I'm talking about. It, this is a more of a system that I can use now. No extra medium at all. And this is going to be the, the heaviest and leanest colors. It's probably almost already too bright for the camera. Let's see. Uh, hey, Hugo. So, depending on the pace of these live streams, uh, I am hoping that we don't have too many incidents. Um, we'll see how it goes. Hey Faith, let's see, what do you use the Galkid for and what would you, I, I'm not using Galkid. Galkid is a fast drying medium like uh, liquid. You can use it by mixing it directly into your paints and making your paints dry faster if you like. Or you can use it to glaze. But if you're going to glaze with a fast dryer it's a good idea to make sure that you have a limited number of layers for example if you have a 20 layer painting i wouldn't recommend glazing with a fast dryer i would glaze with a slow dryer this is a size 2 Silbert bristle brush, uh, silver brush brand. Hey pencil, subway art. I see you made your colors on the palette already, so now you can just map out the colors while painting. Exactly. Yes, you are on the money, right on point. So I'm mixing as I go on the painting, instead of having to mix everything all at once. So this gives me the ability to move much faster and to make decisions on the fly. I'm going to reuse the drawing brush for the shadows. Are you ready? Uh, what are the dimensions of your canvas? This is 11 by 14. 11 by 14 inches. Now you see how I'm mixing directly onto the canvas. So I heard uh, one of my art friends quoted, I think it was Sherry McGraw, uh, that this style of painting is abstract realism. So it starts off very abstract, just kind of uh, one piece at a time. And then these pieces get merge together 
to form a more cohesive structure. Now when it comes to the thickness of a Rembrandt, you really want to start to pile it on very early on. So now I'm actually starting to go right into the textures. One section at a time, just kind of loading the paint on. So yes, the start is hella prima, meaning painting wet on wet, but I'm not trying to give it an ala prima feel. So instead I'm drawing with paint. Uh, good question, JVL. This is not going to be a la prima. So th there is no way on earth that I'm going to be able to finish a Rembrandt in one day, in one sitting. It's just not, it's just, it's, uh, it's a fairy tale to think that one can do a uh, proper Rembrandt study in one day. I have done paint alongs or demonstrations that were ala prima one day things but ever since really i've been sticking with more long-term painting so this is a long-term painting ingrid uh yes this is a relatively newer technique um it, it's not the the fundamentals are still the same as I always say, but in terms of how I'm approaching the painting, what's new really is this uh, system of colors. Um, and when it comes to the paint handling, the thickness of the paint, the richness of the paint is something new for me. It's something that I'm working on. Now if you look at Rembrandt's, they're not uh, hyper realistic they're not intended to be uh, incredibly super realistic but instead they are paintings that have a soul to them there, there's something about the oil paint that comes alive and a lot of that has to do with texture this is why I urge you to use uh, bristle brushes bristle brushes pick up a lot of paint do not use any solvent and at this point I'm gonna I'd hate to say it but the drawing almost becomes secondary to the richness of the paint surface But of course, I'm lying when I say that a little bit because drawing is incredibly important. Oh, thank you, uh, Pencil Subway Art. Uh, yeah, holding the brush from all the way back here is a, is a good practice to have because it keeps you at an arm's length away from the painting. And try to keep the painting at an arm's length away from you as much as you can. Though admittingly, sometimes I do like to be closer to the painting. But the further you are from the painting, the, the more perspective you're gonna have. Now it's very weird to say this, but when you use less, or when you use no medium like this, in an odd way, the oil paint dries faster. It's a little weird, but it does. 
Does this technique have a name? Um, not so much. I didn't really have a name for it. Uh, this color system, I did create a, a lesson for this color system uh, in my online classes. And I just called it a color theorem. The theorem being that if you can optimize this palette, then you can optimize the painting process. Rembrandt was a master in three mediums, a draftsman, painter, and printmaker. I would say that the draftsman is pretty much the foundation of all of it, if you would ask me. Or a draftsperson, however you want to say it. Uh, hey, for you, let's see, how much time does it take? Uh, this will take um, maybe like two weeks or, maybe, I don't know, one, one or two weeks. I'd say probably two weeks. And I'll do my best to stream it. Uh, like I was saying, I'm not, I'm not going to commit to a fixed schedule right now with these streams. But I will stream this, so whenever I work on this, I'll turn the cameras on. Tiling, Leo V, kind of. You can think of it like tiling. That's, that's one way to think about it. Now what I do is I try to figure out the correct relative shape. Now this is full of mistakes, um, and that's fine, that's just part of the process, but I try to find the relative correct shape first, and then once I have that, then I will start to pile on more paint. Ingrid, I'm glad you like this technique. In my classes, uh, students voted for an Ender Zorn master study, so we're actually going to be doing a, a Zorn palette complete painting. But of course, in, in uh, and it works great in theory, but in practice I do like to have the most efficient colors possible for the process. Sometimes with a larger studio painting I'll have like 20 something colors on the palette. But I typically just like to have what I need and not anything in excess. Alright, so now we're going to start to draw a little bit more for the nose. Now I'm going to go in for that pinkish color. 
Hey JBL, no, I, I usually don't uh, scrape or sand. Sometimes I'll scrape a painting if I want to paint over it. Uh, while the painting is still wet, I'll just get a palette knife and scrape it off. But typically, no, I don't uh, incorporate that into the process. Now, for Rembrandt's red, he definitely would have been using a genuine vermilion, which is why I'm not using just straight up cadmium red in here. I did put transparent mummy to try to bring down the saturation a little bit. And usually on the nose right here, there's a lot of texture in Rembrandt paintings. And everything is going to look kind of piecemeal right now. So again, it's just reasoning with shapes right now. Yep, pencil art. Uh, yeah, definitely the Zorn palette is excellent. The only thing is you, you spend a lot longer to create these mixtures with the Zorn palette, but you can create uh, combinations like this minus the green. The Zorn palette green is a little bit, um, it's a little less intense than this. Now, Genuine Vermilion is not, it doesn't seem, at least on the computer screen to me, it doesn't seem to be as orangey. So I, what I like about Cadmium Red Deep is that it's uh, kind of like, almost like a coolish red. So now we're going to start to investigate some of the lights here. Someone who's really good at this, um, layering on very nice and almost like uh, fluid, heavy brush marks is Robert Liberace. If you don't know of Robert Liberace, definitely check out his artworks. Now right about now when things start to begin to look somewhat human is when we enter in the awkward stage. So 
remember the awkward stage is natural in painting. It's it's what makes portrait painting so darn difficult. Is that it starts to look human, but it's not very human. So that's what can kind of make it a little bit daunting to look at. Hey, uh, any art? Hello. And once again, there's no extra medium on here. And every time I need to clear from one or move from one little patch to another, I just add more paint. Sometimes if I need to take some paint off, I'll just use paper towel, dry paper towel. Now once again, trying to go right for the true value is my intention. I am trying to go for the true value. But like I said, I'm not, I know that I'm not going to nail it perfectly. So everything is just kind of being developed uniformly. It's not like I'm trying to go and finish the forehead or like finish an eye or something. Hey, Reddy, do you use multiple brushes for mid-tones, dark tones? And, yep, uh, I have a dark brush and a light brush right now. Uh, but sometimes I will have like a light, light brush, a dark, dark brush, a middle, middle brush. Okay, so this area is where it gets kind of complicated. So it gets the, the plane start to turn away even more as we move down the cheekbone. Now as I sit back, I notice the shadow it's actually a little lighter, so I'm going to use Italian brown ochre. Lighten it slightly. So not only can I pick and choose from these, but I can pick and choose from my uh, out of the tube colors too. If this were a 1620 painting, would I have chosen a bigger brush? Is it a good idea to use more brushes, JVL? Uh, that's really up to you. If this were a bigger painting, let me tell you what, if this were a bigger painting, I would not have gone through the drawing, the umber drawing that quickly. In fact, I would have just spent the entire day on the umber drawing. And then I would go into like the face so after I draw like from like the hands head down the hands for example right so the first day would be just umber drawing for me just this and I would probably actually put in the dark of the background first and then the next day after all that's dry I would start to go into an area of focus like the face and work with the same kind of brushes you know, sometimes I use a larger brush sometimes I'll opt for a size 4 Sometimes a size six. But Rembrandt studies, in, in my opinion, you can do almost any technique, doesn't matter. Uh, you just have to make sure that you pay a lot of attention 
to your textures. So whether it's a large size 6 bristle or a size 2 bristle doesn't quite matter as long as you use the correct amount of paint. Right, so now I'm actually going to jump down to the chin. Uh, there is a nice half tone right underneath the lip. Rembrandt's painterly abbreviation is really nice to learn from. Uh, painterly abbreviation is what you choose to omit. So you can actually almost not even see a lower lip there. But you know it's there from the distance. Okay, so now we're going to have to go and darken some of the accents. So I switched to the dark brush. Darkening that. I'm going to add a little bit of warmth underneath the nose. Hey Michael, when you say the correct amount of paint to get the right texture, what do you mean? So the texture in an oil painting is very simple. It's just a pile of paint on top of a surface, right? On top of your paint, painting support. Uh, so for example, in the shadows, they're usually a bit more transparent. Uh, they're less thick usually. That's kind of a 17th century uh, type of look. So I want the most paint on the brush to be in these very light areas, which is why it's actually glaring a lot on the camera, because there's a ton of paint there. So if I put too much texture in the shadow, it would kind of look too modern. So in the shadows, I'm moving the brush a lot more. In the lights, I'm kind of just like uh, caking on. So for example, like this is this would be like caking on the light. You kind of get to weave the paint around.
And I'm doing this knowing that it's not going to be a very pretty sight. It's not going to be a very aesthetically pleasing image for a long time. So that's really why the editing is really important in those pre-recorded videos. But you don't really see the in-between stuff, like what's going on here. Yep, no problem, Michael. All right, we have a little bit of light for the facial hair. And let me tell you, um, demos can be very deceptive. Uh, so, for example, uh, my painting demonstrations. Like, I, I always say in the video, this is... If it's an edited video, I'll say this is edited. It's not, you're not seeing every single brush stroke. Now, pretty much almost all painting demonstrations are a little bit deceptive because when you're doing a painting demonstration, you've got this pressure of people watching you and then you don't want to put something down that doesn't look aesthetically appealing. At this point, I'm trying not to think about creating something that's pretty or something that's, uh, uh, you know, like competent looking just yet. At this point, this is really about trying to put in the information that I can work with. Prioritizing that over prioritizing any kind of look. I mean, sure, you can go in with a big loaded brush and push some paint around and then it might look like a pretty image, but that's not really what this is about. This is about learning the foundation, learning the fundamentals, and being able to create almost like visual poetry with it. Hey Derek, uh, let's see, yes, highlights, texture, shadow, thin and smooth, uh, let's see, lots do this in represent representational art today, definitely. Hey Derek, um, yeah, it's just my microphone, it's a clip-on microphone, so it, it does pick up some, uh, some static. I apologize for that. All right, now let's go in with the shadows. To tell the truth, looking on the screen, especially live, the camera won't be able to capture the real colors and textures. That is correct. Yeah, it's not. And it, I, it looks like it's glaring a lot to me. I don't know what it looks like to you. Uh, I'm going to actually take a break soon and I'm going to adjust my lighting. So I'm going to take a break in like maybe a minute or so. But it doesn't mean I'm going to go away. I'm going to just take maybe like a couple minutes break. Painting for hours on end without taking a break is about one of the worst things you can do for your painting process. So always give yourself all the breaks that you need. Oh, thanks, Derek. All right, so speaking of which, I'm now going to take a break. So you're now going to see this image. The painting will resume in a few minutes. This doesn't mean that I'm gone forever. This just means I'm taking a break. I will also shut the mic off. So I'm going to give myself about a couple of minutes. I'm going to stretch a little bit. Feel free to communicate amongst each other in the comments. Let's just keep it uh, as art focused and respectful as possible.
and I will resume in a couple minutes. Alright everyone, I am back now after taking a short break. Like I said, these streams are going to be a little different, so I'm going to keep it as art-focused as possible. Let me take the... Or put the screen back. So let's keep it as art-focused as possible. 
I did leave a little uh, thing on my camera, so hopefully you can see it better. But I do have to shut that off, so hold on a second. And hold on. A little delay here. I need a camera person. Come on, camera. <laughs> hold on. There we go. Give me a second here. I'm right here. I'm going to. Okay. I'm going to fix that for you in just a minute. There we go. I had to adjust the lighting on my camera so it wouldn't glare so much for you. Okay, there it is. Now it looks normal again. Alright, so let's continue painting for a little bit. And then like I said, I'm not going to have a fixed schedule just yet for these streams. So basically whenever I'm working on this painting, I will turn the cameras on. The camera? Oh. Hold on a second. Maybe you're right, it's a little dark. Hold on a second. I'm gonna adjust it once again. I'm not really an expert when it comes to the uh, camera focus and all that stuff. So let's see if this is any better. And I'm probably going to only paint for a little less than an hour after this, so it's not really going to be as long as the first part. There. Does that look better? Hey Brad Phillips. Oh wow, thanks for watching the YouTube channel since the beginning. Yeah, I think I've I've been on YouTube since 2017. I've been here for some time now. Hey Claire. Thanks Pencil Subway. Alright, so now I'm going to go ahead and start to figure some stuff out in the shadows. I think that's the last thing I left off at. If you know any any other live streamers or people that do this kind of thing, make sure to remind them to take breaks. That's one of the worst things that I did in the past is that I didn't really take breaks. So just like when you're painting, make sure to give yourself plenty of time to rest not a good idea to be hyper focused for a long period of time it's it's not good for the body
Usually when I paint, I actually have Netflix playing. I, I have something playing on the side, but, but anyway, let, let's keep this about the painting. Um, speaking of painting, so right now what I'm trying to do is evaluate this section of the portrait. It's very complex. There's a lot of forms moving in and out. Um, so there's a lot of things that need to be studied. And like I said, if I was just mixing and mixing and mixing as I go on the palette, it would take me a lot more time to get to, say, this value when I can just do it in just two, two little mixtures here. Uh oh, what happened here? Oh no, that was okay. Uh, yeah, we. I don't think we had the timeout, Brad. Um. Yeah. And yeah, uh, there's going to be a lot of drawing mistakes in here. There's going to be a lot of things that don't quite add up yet, and that's okay. So I'm just going in and refining one small piece at a time. But I'm not going to spend, say, like all the time just in this eye trying to uh, make it look exactly like the picture. Uh, instead, I'm basically just walking my way around the portrait. Hey Marcelo, no worry. Um, Ingrid, yeah, I have done a lot of Rembrandt and uh, Rembrandt studies, as I was saying, I learn something new every time. And I'm kind of trying to stick with 17th century, uh, 17th century style paintings. If you look at all the centuries after the 17th century, it's almost like they wanted to be painting in the 17th century. Maybe not obviously in the living conditions back then, but the I, I think the golden age of painting is 17th century, if you ask me. Hey, EX, the artist. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. I'm doing all right just here, starting a Rembrandt. And um, I've been doing well, just teaching my online classes. And uh, now that the world has opened up a little bit more, at least here in the DC area, I'm painting uh, much more with art groups than I used to, with uh, painting with other artists. Hey Tammy, uh, this video will be available later as a pre-recorded video. And Claire, yes, this isn't finished. It won't be finished for a while. This is just rough, roughing in, just uh, going in and drawing. But no, this is not finished, not even close. Hey JVL, uh, that is the beauty of using oils. Everything is flexible. This is true. That's one of the things I really like about oil paint. It's very forgiving.
Let's see. Hey, pencil, pencil art. Uh, Rembrandt versus Vermeer. Anything that makes them distinct from each other? You know, a funny question. I think there's a YouTube video uh, about uh, art conservationists talking about Rembrandt versus Vermeer. I think it's titled Rembrandt versus Vermeer on YouTube, unless they took it down. Um, I wouldn't consider Vermeer a portrait painter specifically. I think Vermeer is more of a, he's more of a all around compositional painter for lack of, a lack of better words. Um, I'd, I'd say Vermeer is a master at master in composition composing a whole picture and Rembrandt is too but Rembrandt um, I liken myself to someone who paints uh, portraits more than anything and I think Rembrandt was the same in that regard and Vermeer was more at least it seems like to me was more about the whole picture and making the whole picture um, you know read really well across the room but don't get me wrong, that's important, even in a portrait like this, but I think Vermeer is more of a, a, a gifted composer. His, his compositions um, are some of the best compositions, I think, in art history. Whereas Rembrandt's portraits, I think, are some of the best portraits in all of art history. If that makes any sense. A good question, though. And it's all, it's all up to opinion, really. I mean, one person may think something completely different than another, and that's fine. Hey Claire, um, I keep the comments on a separate web page so I'm able to read them. Before I used to try to read it off my computer screen, um, the same computer screen with the live, uh, but it's actually easier for me to have it on a separate web page. Hey, pencil art. Oh, let's see. Good point. Vermeer did love using reflections and had interesting narrative. Rembrandt had mood and control of portraits. Yep, exactly. Hey, Michael. After ren rendering the color tiles, will you do some blending or layering? Um, yeah, but not too much in this in this layer. Next time, I will definitely do more of that. Emily. Ingrid, I'm glad you like this new format. Oh, I understand, Claire. I mean, I usually, when I paint, I like to have some kind of distractions. So in a way, it does help. It, it does help to be able to... Uh, look at the screen or look at something other than the painting. Hey, chocolate peanut butter. So how do you feel about this painting so far? It's just a start. Today is just going to be a start. It's mainly just drawing, just trying to get things down. In this fast-paced world, I think 
representational painting or uh, realist painting is a nice uh, departure from the rapidity of everyday life. You know, with Instagram and everything having to be done at the moment, living in the moment, I think it's time. It, it's a good time to, to, to spend a lot of time on something. So when you ask me what do I think about this painting at, at the moment, to me, at the moment, this is nothing more than just laying something down. This is like the first few brush strokes. Hey, JVL, is the key using small, uh, small brush marks? Uh, I, I don't think that there's a, a key, like a secret to painting like this. If anything, it's really just about the fundamentals. Structure, light and shadow, planes. That really makes up the core of all of it. But whether you use large brush strokes or small brush strokes, it's really up to you. I'm basically feeding the canvas the texture uh, of the oil paint. I want this to be a nice and hefty, uh, rich, uh, paint film for the first layer and like I was saying before I'm almost prioritizing that more than anything else whereas in the past I would have been very focused in trying to make this look good so to speak you know like when I was live streaming in the past I had that pressure that this thing has to look good and now not really not now it's the texture, and I know that you can't really see too much of the texture with the camera, but that's what I'm prioritizing over anything else. Hey, uh, let's see, uh, Ready, any tips for getting better at gauging values? This right here, this little system here, the so one, two, three, four, there's four major values here for the face. And for example, when it began, I was like, okay, this is definitely the lightest light. Then this was a step down. And then I started to go all about around these uh, values. And one of my teachers says that the painting ultimately ends up reflecting the palette. So if there's a balance on the palette, then the painting will appear to have a balance as well. Also one thing you can do, this might be kind of controversial, but um, instead of painting from a screen, try to get a high quality printout. Ingrid, a name to this system? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's a fairly common thing. I think that many painters do use this approach. I don't know if putting a name for it would, or would be something that 
uh, would differentiate it from anything else. I'm going to share a secret with you is that something I've discovered with Rembrandt paintings. And I don't know why, but a lot of times with Rembrandt paintings, you see a little bit of vermilion there underneath of the eyelid. Now, clearly, yes, there is warmth in the eyelids, but Rembrandt exaggerates it. And that's something that I think distinguishes a Rembrandt. If someone were to show me a Rembrandt and I didn't see that little bit of vermilion underneath of the uh, upper eyelid, I would really question the authenticity of it. Hey Richard, um, is this going to get, oh uh, yeah, this is going to be saved as a pre-recorded video. So you'll definitely be able to watch this uh, after the stream ends. Hey DJ Crane, uh, have you ever entered or thought about entering the BP Portrait Award? It restarts in 2023. I haven't entered, I've only ever entered uh, Portrait Society of America. I've never been accepted there, but um, I would like to enter more competitions. Hey, Ready, do you prefer using lead white? What is a good supplement for countries that don't sell lead based paint? Um, yeah, I do prefer using. Lead white, um, a good substitute for example, um, if you're using titanium white, put small amounts of yellow ochre in it. I believe Michael Harding sells a color called warm white, so that would be a good one. I think that actually has a little bit of yellow ochre already mixed into it. Uh, for example, when it comes to the handling of lead white, I'd say Gamblin Flake White Replacement is close, but not exactly the same as the handling of Lead White. So if you get any kind of Warm White or Flake White Replacement, that would be much better than just using straight up Titanium White. I would never suggest using straight Titanium White for skin tones. I used to, uh, but not so much anymore. And if you create these little premixtures like I've done here, then you solve that problem automatically because you see I'm not really taking straight lead white anyway and putting it onto the, the, the face, although I could. Oh, hey, Carol. Yeah, we were just uh, talking earlier today. I didn't mention I would do a, a live stream. So I just started this Rembrandt. Easy goes it. Easy goes. So those of you that are online students of mine, you can definitely paint or draw along with this one and send it for the virtual classroom.
Speaking of texture, this needs a lot more light. I think we're actually going to go in with lead tin yellow. And that is lead tin yellow type. I believe it's type 2. Again, it's from Rublev. Um, yeah, lead tin yellow. I think it's type 2. It's a, it's the lighter version of lead tin yellow. Hey friends, Tesca. Oh, I'm glad that you liked this video. Um, would I do a video on painting using a grayscale? Um, that's a good idea. Uh, uh, that would be a monochrome painting. A painting fully in monochrome. I will take note of that suggestion. Hey Claire, uh, let's see. Feel like a beginner amongst masters, but I've been too scared to try oil painting. I mostly use gouache. Any tips on starting out with oil paints? Let me tell you, um, I was actually talking with a, a student of mine about this before, and if you're used to using, uh, say, acrylic or something like that, or, or gouache or something, it takes some getting used to uh, switching to oil paints and you may not even like oil paints for a while um, not always the case sometimes uh, you can jump right into it and really like it from the get-go but my best advice with getting started with oil paint especially if you want to do portraits is just get yourself the Zorn palette four tubes of oil paint uh, the Zorn palette is white, red, yellow ochre, black. Whether it's titanium white or lead white, I'd say if you're just starting then it's okay to start with titanium white. And just like this, just take this as an example, just keep your paints on your palette in a secure location where things can't get messy or whatever. And when you're done painting, just get your paints, put them in a Tupperware box or something, store them in the freezer, and they'll be re uh, you can reuse them. Okay, let's see. Hey Richard, how close to Rembrandt's technique have you obtained? It definitely is very involved. Uh, how close to Rembrandt's technique? I, I don't know if I'm that close yet. I think it's going to take a lot more. And I don't think it's about the process. I don't think uh, following a set number of steps is the way to obtain a Rembrandt. I think a Rembrandt style, a Rembrandt, um, a Rembrandt-esque, I'm going to use that word, I'm going to make it up. A Rembrandt-esque painting is a lot has a lot to do with texture and um, poetry, I think. Hey Francesca, okay, I'm a beginner with oil paints. Would you like, uh, let's see, I would like great tips on what to buy, very intimidated with oil colors. I would like to try monochromatic. Um, yeah, black and white painting is good. If you just buy ivory black and white, that's a good one to use. And yep, Carol is in the group Zoom 
here on my Patreon. So we were just painting together on Zoom not too long ago. And the paint kind of takes on an individual character or some kind of quality when you layer it on, uh, layer after layer of oil paint. Hey, ready? At what stage of the painting should you get the background in? That's totally up to you. I mean, uh, some painters will just go right into the background first. They'll do the drawing, and then they'll go in with the darks first. That's a very classical way to do it. Uh, I I like to draw the face. Uh, try to get as much texture on the face as I can, and then I kind of do the background later with a small portrait. Um, if it were a big painting, I would do the more classical way, which would be to cover the background. But for time's sake, I'm, I'm going right into the face. I mean, uh, impasto. Yes, this is impasto. Um, an impasto is not um, not really a technique. It's it's just it just means a uh, thick paint. So, for example, this area is hitting the light a lot. So, I'm gonna put a ton of paint, small amounts of paint at a time. Just as someone mentioned before, unfortunately you can't really see it that well with the camera. But there's a lot of texture. You know, I'm just weaving the paint. Someone who is definitely a master at that, um, who is um, a brilliant painter, is David LaFell. If you haven't heard of David LaFell, definitely look him up. He's uh, been referred to as like the reincarnation of Rembrandt. Hey Francesca, no worries. Uh, let's see. Are there any colors I should add when just trying monochrome or just stick with ivory black? I just stick with black and white. And you can always paint over that if you want to go with color. Um, just make sure that the black and white, excuse me, make sure the black and white is completely dry. And I think there was a question there. Um, another question. What brand of materials do you use? I like to use Rublev, uh, JVL. Uh, it's also typed up for you in the description box. Uh, let's see. Eric Wildy, let's see. First time live and just started oil painting and just want to say I'm learning so much from you. Oh, awesome. Welcome to the wonderful world of oil painting. Um, it is a fun and difficult process. But having more than a decade of um, experience, I will tell you, um, there's really nothing like it. I mean that in a good way. Um, yep, and it's in the description.
Oh, thanks for your comments, uh, Lucy Hanks. Okay. So I think we're almost there, uh, almost at a good spot to let this dry. And in fact, my uh, colors, uh, the Rublev oil paints, along with the Williamsburg, um, the one Williamsburg I have here, which is this one, Williamsburg Cobalt Blue, all, uh, believe it or not, 24 hours from now, this is going to be touch dry. And I'm not even using Alkid. Uh, so the drying time with Rublev is great. So if you've never tried Rublev, I'm not sponsored by this brand. I'm just telling you, um, they are really, really solid paints. But other brands such as Winsor Newton and Gamblin work fine too. In fact, my Alizarin Permanent is a Gamblin color. Hey, JVL, um, acrylics are, are good to use. I mean, um, you know, classical painters tend not to work in acrylics, but, you know, I mean, whatever works. Okay, so there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be described in the light. But I think we're getting to a point now where it's going to be good to let dry. Now, obviously, when I when I do when I start these Rembrandts on my own, I actually spend much more time, and I may do a few changes here and there, but I'm not going to do too much. I do want to save it for the live streams and the. Uh, the uh, audience, all of you have been great, uh, excellent. Your questions and comments have been, uh, you know, really, really good questions and comments. And I, I think that this is this is good. Uh, we're we're doing uh, we're keeping the pace of discussion very uh, professional, and that, that's what I want. You know, before I was kind of like a talk show host. So kind of uh, making it more down to earth. Eric, uh, find it super peaceful, almost like a full day of meditation. On Saturday and Sunday, I paint for about eight hours each day. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, each day. Well, yeah, and that's good. It's it's good to have a kind of calm, meditative state. Let's see. Pencil art. Artists should not mean oils. Artists create with any medium they prefer to have on hand. Yep, that is true. I agree with you there. But I, I would be contradicting myself if I didn't uh, I didn't boast about the the awesomeness of oil paint. I ever since I started painting, I've loved the consistency of oil paint. It's just always felt very right to me. Um, and I have tried acrylic before, but there's something about the historicalness of oil paint. And these materials, I mean, lead white. I mean, that's what Rembrandt, uh, that's what Rembrandt had on his palette. Obviously, he would have had the Dutch process, uh, lead white. But you know, it's these historical colors. I think it was Robert Liberace said this: if if these materials do nothing for you, other than motivate you to paint, then that's that's. Uh, I don't know how he said it, but you know. You don't need to have these genuine historical colors, but if they motivate you to paint like it motivates me to paint, that's a good thing. Mm 
Oh, thanks, Ingrid. Okay, so I think we're winding down. About 10 p.m. my time, so it's going to be time to clean off the palette and the brushes. And like I said, I think this is at a good stopping point. Would like to see my face, JVL. <laughs> you can see this this creature up here. This is my my hair. I haven't had a haircut in a while, so I think I'm gonna stay away from the camera for the time being. Hey, black and white. So we're actually just wrapping up this painting session. As I mentioned before, um, I'm not gonna have a set schedule with these live streams. I'm pretty much just gonna turn the camera on whenever I'm painting. Also, the uh, the footage will be available as a pre-recorded uh, pre-recorded video. So if you missed a lot of the uh, footage, don't worry. This will still be available as a pre-recorded video. So I'm going to hang out for a couple of minutes and answer any art-related questions. For those of you that may be looking at this painting and wondering the direction it's going to go. I have an example for you. Last week, um, this was the YouTube video painting. Yes, this is a painting that I did. And this was um, another Rembrandt study. It's actually kind of sunken in a little bit, but we're heading towards this kind of direction. Two weeks of painting, so uh, several painting sessions. So if you look at the pre-recorded video where this one was created, many many hours went into that so looking at this it looks really rough right don't worry we're gonna go in and draw more stuff onto it this is more about just laying in a foundation and putting in uh, the texture so to speak okay hey claire enjoyed watching you paint uh, let's see. Okay. So, any questions? Oh, thanks, black and white. And uh, like I said, this is um, I'm changing the pace a little bit of these live streams. Where in the past, you know, we did a little happy dance whenever a painting was sold or something. Not anymore. This this is going to be very um, about painting, only about painting, and uh, slow and steady pace. Slow and steady wins the race, as they say. Uh, any thoughts on M. Graham or Michael Harding? I haven't used M. Graham, but I do have uh, some Michael Harding colors, and I think they're really solid oil paints. Um... The only thing I would look out for with M. Graham is a lot of them have zinc in them, so I would uh, be a little cautious with that. Hey, Eric Wildy, uh, how do you keep the oils from getting sunken in or dulling as they dry? Uh, sinking in is part of it. I mean, um, so for example, like, let me turn it to the glare side. Okay, so there's some sinking in going on here and some sinking in going on here and that's okay uh, if there's different levels of shininess of the painting that's fine when the painting is varnished it all evens out so I'm going to show you one that's varnished so this one uh, has some dust on it but this is varnished so if we turn to the glare side do you see that it all evens out after you varnish it. And yes, there's going to be some stuff like that. That's not sunken in or anything. That's just different textures. So after you varnish it, then uh, the, painting, the paintings are pretty much good to go and ready to be um, basically hung and on display for centuries, centuries to come. Is oil better than acrylic to use? Good question. Um, 
really that depends on how you define better uh, when it comes to old master looking paintings then yes uh, I'd say oil paint uh, is the one I would choose but an oil painter will always say that oil painting is better and acrylic painter will say that acrylic painting is better so it de really depends on who you ask uh, black and white are monochromatic studies useful to those just starting uh, oil uh, oil painting yes uh, black and white is a very good uh, good way to start hey lens uh, CRIV oh thank you hey, pencil subway art uh, it is a gloss um, I use Gamvar picture varnish uh, the gloss so as you're seeing here it's a a uniform gloss. I mean, you could go for like a matte uh, if you want, like a matte varnish. But I don't know. I like um, I like the gloss. You see a lot of old master paintings that are similar in the reflectiveness to that. So I don't know. I, I like gloss. Uh, how come the finished painting looks smooth after so many thick layers? It, that um, it really depends on the glare. Uh, I think this might be glaring a lot, so I might have to change the light a little bit, but this one has a lot of texture, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's a lot of texture there, and it's just layer after layer after layer. It just kind of, from a distance, it looks smooth, but when you look at it, it it's individual pieces are, are kind of rough, where here, everything is rough. So... This will kind of be um, woven together just like this one is. Hey, black and white. Oh, actually, that is Rembrandt. Isn't that cool? Uh, this is a version of Rembrandt when I think he was 22. And this is a version of Rembrandt when he's older. Uh, I think this one uh, from the photo reference was painted the same year as this one, but isn't that cool? It's the same person, but um, different at different points of their life. So it's always important to do self-portraits, everyone, even though a lot of uh, people seem to hate self-portraits. It's a very good idea to do them, because not only does it record how you appeared uh, at that point to yourself, but also the skill level you were at at that point in your life. Oh, thank you, uh, Pencil Subway Art. Yeah, great group tonight, definitely. Uh, everyone in the audience, thank you so much for being so kind and, and respectful during the, excuse me, during the stream. So if we can keep this kind of pace with live streams, then we'll definitely do many more of these. Like I said, I'm not going to have a fixed schedule yet. Um, so if you would like to watch one of these streams live uh, please subscribe to the youtube channel and just turn on notifications and on your phone wherever you are it'll just notify you when i'm painting but nonetheless the footage will be available as a pre-recorded video hey lucy hanks um yeah i wish i could charge 10 times the amount that i'm charging Oh, okay, so he's 63 in this one. So once again, um, the, the photo reference is linked in the description box, so definitely feel free to draw, paint along with me, and then the next time I'm working on this, then you can also draw and paint along with me. And uh, definitely feel free to share on your social medias, uh, share your Rembrandt studies. All right, so thanks again, everyone. So thank you. Thanks for watching. Like I said, 
Uh, really good group tonight, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for uh, attending and uh, writing down comments and being very respectful. And that, that to me, is really, really awesome because, you know, in the past, the live streams did get a little crazy. So um, thank you so much, everyone. Also, I will continue this one in this live format at some point in the future. So just stay tuned on the YouTube channel and we'll continue working on this after it's uh, thoroughly dry. So thank you so much, everyone. I wish you the very best in your artwork and I will see you on the next one.